Um, okay, so I would like to talk a little bit about Ruby. Uh, no one ever really does that at the Ruby meetup. So I thought I would take the, the opportunity to do so. Uh, one of the mo most basic things about Ruby, and let me reintroduce myself. My name's Joel Metter. I work at Expect Behavior. And this is about modules and how they can screw you and be awesome at the same time. Um, so one of the basic building blocks of functionality in Ruby is called the module. Um, unlike, <laughs> Color. Whatever, psychedelic time. Um, so modules are a way of uh, adding functionality to classes in Ruby. Um, technical term is mix-in. Anyone who's been doing coding for more than a couple of years has probably heard this term. Um, you can use mix-ins to emulate a lot of features that other uh, programming language have, like C++ has... <laughs> it's really going nuts. What's going on? Uh, like C++ has multiple inheritance, which, yeah, we don't have the connection anymore. Yeah. I was wondering if it's... Oh. Don't touch it. I'm not letting go. This is fine. We'll work with pink. <laughs> Nobody touch it. Uh, right, so you can do a lot of stuff with uh, modules that other languages do. Um, but the basic theory is you put some, some functionality into your module, and then you throw it onto some Ruby class or some Ruby object, and, and then you get some stuff. So I've got a few examples here that I want to run through. Um, so this is like the super most basicest thing ever that could ever work probably with a module. Um, what's going on is on this line I'm just including it in the basically the global namespace so if I run it at the command line I'll get that. Um, and what's happening is I'm just calling it there. Um, Pretty easy, right? And if anyone has any questions while I'm going along, you just answer them. Or if you have suggestions on how my code could be much, much better, go for that too. Uh, another thing that you can do, this is just another example. Um, a lot of the functionality of Ruby is already modularized, like in the core language itself. Um, so there's not a real good reason why you would ever do something like this, like that I can think of, but I'm sure there is an actual good thing, and one of your clients will almost certainly come up with it. Um, so this is just going to include the math module, which has a bunch of functions. Um, let's see, this is probably going to be awful, but let's try it in here. Yeah, so I added uh, some stuff. No, it didn't work. Never mind. Okay, well, I'm not doing what I think I'm doing. I'm just going to skip past that. Um, so here's a more reasonable way that you would use it. Usually when you do module uh, addition, you will include a module into a class uh, because you have some functionality that is basically will be used in multiple classes, but you want it to be, you know, it might be, it might be some like axes, uh, as paranoid or something uses this sec uses techniques like these, like a lot of the, the plugins and, and gems and rails use this sort of thing. But basically you just include it in your class like this, and then you get the uh, you get that method that I have defined in this module up here. So let me run that one. And uh, yeah, super easy. Uh, another thing that you can do is, um, because basically everything in Ruby is a class, you can actually include functionality from a module into, um, into the class level scope of a Ruby, Ruby class. So what that looks like, um, and that's a different thing than include, you use extend to do that, and that basically throws things in on a class level. So instead of doing... Uh, include here and getting steel on a new home object, I actually get it on the home curve. Yeah, on the score class, sorry. So this is, that would functionally be equivalent of writing this. Okay. 
So those are the same, basically, same thing. Um, super simple. Um, you can include and extend the same module onto the same class if you really feel like you want to do that. Um, So that's kind of kind of interesting. Sometimes you'll do that. Um, I'll show you maybe why you might want to. Um, so here's kind of the first weird thing that I'll I'll show you in this. Um, it's around constants and what happens when you include constants in a module. Um, when you include a module that has constants in it, uh, they get pulled in. So when I included M in class C, then that constant got defined on class C. When I extended it, it did not. Um, you can see this super interesting error right here on this line, which is you know name error. What's that mean? Um, and that just has to do with how how these things work. Um, it's something you'll you'll pick up. Um, there's a way to get around that, which I have here. Um, and I didn't say it before, but all of this will be on GitHub after my presentation, so you guys can go check it out in more detail. Um, so this is not the greatest thing ever, but it's like a little hack that I knocked out in a couple minutes. Um, and what I did was, since Ruby classes are all open all the time, you can just do whatever you want. Uh, it's called mon monkey patching. Um, and what I did was I just made a new method on the module class itself um, that basically will uh, put any constants inside of a module onto a class when you use extend so that you can actually get that behavior um, and really it's there's some cool stuff here that maybe you haven't seen like uh, const get and const set um, which is a way to do dynamic constant creation and and getter setter stuff. Um, so, there you go. We got value back. We're good. Um, let's see. You can do multiple module inclusion. Um, the thing that this slide is, or this one is all about, is. Uh, this. Let me make it all bigger. Uh, so what you can do is is programmatically inspect Ruby classes to find out what modules have been mixed into them. Um, in this case, I get in the game master elm and kernel. Uh, kernel is something you just kind of get because that's that's where uh, classes come from. Um, but you know, that's really cool, uh, really awesome if you're doing some really crazy dynamic programming type stuff. Does anyone know a way to make terminal always stay full when you like increase, decrease the size of the font? No? Okay. Yeah, you can use the size. If you have another like tab, which is like a different size. No. I don't think so. Um, I forget why I wrote this one, but let's go ahead and look at it. Uh, yes, so classes are open. Um, I defined a module and a bunch of empty classes. Uh, this is to kind of show off another thing that Ruby does, which is called class exec. Um, really handy if you want to add some functionality to your thing. Um, and basically, when I'm when I you know put code here, that means that code is going to execute as if I wrote it. Here, um, I don't know what else is going on. Uh, module exec is an alias for class exec, and send is a cool thing that if you haven't done much Ruby before, basically lets you just say, or it basically tells an object to, you know, run run the method that you call on it. In this case, I'm telling it to run the method include. Um, so let's run this. And we get it included three those three ways on those blank classes. Pretty neat. 
Um, really powerful thing that Ruby has around modules is uh, callbacks. And this link right here has a pretty good list of all the callbacks that are available in Ruby. But uh, the two that are pertinent to this talk are uh, included and extended. Um, when you define a module, you can uh, put code inside these and basically do things at the point that the, the, the module gets included or extended. Um, so I didn't do anything fancy here, but you can see I have a C which includes and a D which extends, and I should see some, some callback stuff. Callback stuff. Um, so this base is actually the class, I believe, that's, that's coming in there. Um, so that's really neat. And I'll show you a bigger example where that's used, um, which is actually it's a Rails plugin that we wrote uh, in Expected Behavior. Um, so there are some pitfalls with modules. Uh, most of them are, are around kind of uh, method or constant or anything like that kind of collision. So if you have the same method defined twice, you can run into it. So in this case, uh, I am defining hello on m and n. And uh, I'm going to include M and then include N. Um, this might be a thing that you haven't seen. If you've used C Sharp, you've probably seen partial classes, which kind of are the same idea. But uh, you can, at any point, really just type in that same class decoration, declaration and just kind of go to town and write some more code, which is really great. And you should do it all the time. <laughs> and that's a lie if you can't detect the sarcasm. I'm a little bit nervous, so there's some sarcasm uh, problems here. But anyway. Uh, yeah, so you can see the first one, maybe you can't see. First one says, I am from M. Second one says, I am from N. Which basically means I just pounded that method right out of existence. Um, just a thing you have to keep in mind if you start monkey patching a lot. Um, don't monkey patch a lot because you'll have this problem and you'll get angry. Um, so kind of the classic way to handle this, and there is a better way to do it that involves some really crazy stuff and included, but I couldn't figure it out before the talk, so, uh, and I didn't bring my phone cable so I couldn't get the internet. Uh, so I gave up and did it the stupid way. Uh, but anyway, so aliasing means uh, making the original content of a method available at a different method signature. Um, in this case, after I include M, I am going to alias that hello method that got mixed into the class at original hello. Um, and then I'm going to include in, which will basically plow out the hello that was originally defined and, and redefine it. Um, so. That looks like this, and I did the dot methods, which might be a new thing too. Um, you can program programmatically inspect Ruby objects, basically the methods that they respond to. Um, there's also this. So you can see that true from respond to. Pretty cool. Um, so yeah, cool stuff there. Um, and this is the last real slide that might be of interest to anyone who's just starting out. Um, this is a gotcha that's kind of hard to get around and I couldn't actually figure out a good way to do it because again, it's been a while since I had to do it and I couldn't figure out how without the internet. So probably there's a way and if anyone knows it, tell me. Um, so if you define a method in a class, uh, in this case hello, and then the same method name or the same method signature in a module, and then you try to include it, um, what will happen is the the method that was defined in the class won't give up. It's kind of odd. Um, the super stupid way that I figured out how to do it was to just class eval my way out of it. Um, <clears throat> not recommended, but it is a thing that you can do. Um, yeah, so 
Any questions so far? Is this all so, straightforward? One of your examples used uh, a second module included a first, and then the third included the second, and, and they, they had the first two had the same uh, method name, so one got stepped on. When if, uh, if the class uh, mixes in two methods that, I mean, two um, uh, modules that don't themselves include each other, and they have the same method name, how does Ruby resolve? Uh, which method to call? Do you have to always like, namespace it with the modules? Uh, you can probably reference it directly by, I don't know, is it prepend the module name to call the specific method? But what if you don't do that? What well, does Ruby complain or does it come to take each method? Uh, so you're asking if I include M and then include N in the same class, what happens? Correct. And, they, uh, and those, they, don't, they don't have any other relationship to each other other than they happen to have a method that is the same name. The original method is gone. Last yeah. defined. Yes. Yeah. It's the last, last in, in. Last one in when? Yep. Okay. okay. Um, there's some stuff that you can do uh, using the super keyword when you're doing it uh, with like class definition, like if it's defined on the class itself. But um, I didn't actually include that example. Um, <coughs> But yeah, it's it's last in the, the method just disappears. I think there's some there are some ways I think that you can reflect and go dig it out again, but it's not it's not straightforward really. Which is why you usually uh, yeah, if you namespace your modules and are reasonably careful, then you can get around the problem. Um, generally, you want to not have this problem because it causes some really weird bugs. Um, did you happen to do any examples that have both a class method and an instance method in the same module anywhere? Uh, yeah, it's like maybe three. What? Like, your example, I think it was Sorry, I mean like one module defines both a class method and an instance method. So I, I think that, at least for me, has fallen into the default category previously. There's a new. There's an active model module for doing that. Oh yeah. Um, usually there's like a, a pattern that you usually do. Yeah, like that. Right. Yeah, I was going to show this. This is uh, this is kind of a more in-depth thing. This is um, an Active Record plugin. Um, so what's going on here? This is actually this is an initRB file, which is a thing that if you have a plugin will be run to initialize. Uh, the plugin. Um, and what's going on here is uh, I am including including my module, and inside that module, I am basically going to extend and include in the way that I want to, because it's somewhat it's somewhat difficult to write the code in such a way without doing this that it will be readable. Um, but if you do this, essentially what you do is you define a module. And then inside that module, you define your instance and class methods. So what's happening is actually when I included on Active Record Base uh, this this module that I'm in right now, then what I do is I I extend my class methods and include my instance methods. Um, so in this case, this is a super simple one, but um, you know this is about about as much as you need to know about it to, to do that. Um, is that what you meant? Yeah, sorry, I, I didn't mean to drag it maybe too far forward. I just, this is one that like seems to come up that's maybe a little harder to track down than, than some of the other ones in my experience. Yep, this is, this is pretty much the classic way to do this in Rails. There is, I think YCATS maybe put forward another way, which is different. I wouldn't argue that it's better, but it's different. Um, but yeah, this is this is kind of the classic where you define two modules and they each have their own thing, um, and then you can get into some really messy, weird code down here. Not messy, exactly, but complicated. Um, so, unless anyone has any more questions, that's my presentation. I hope you learned something about modules. Is it better just to use the names for different instances? Is that just hard to do with one of the programs? Uh, once you get to a certain size, 
it can become difficult, especially if you're doing, um, let's say for example you have a, an active record model and it acts as paranoid, acts as archival, acts as cheese grater, acts as some other thing that you've never heard of really. Like, eventually, if you attach enough behavior to a given uh, class, you're just going to have collision of some sort. So yes, typically a way around that is to just name your things really bizarre, like zebra stripes are stupid, is my method name. Um, the problem with that is it's not semantic at all, and yeah. it causes serious problems when you want to actually explain it to people or use it yourself. So you're like, ah, oh, what did I call that thing? It's kind of the, it's the name problem, really. So it's just more practical to write <coughs> Sorry, I can't hear what you're saying. <coughs> so these becoming more practical to write a little bit more security around that problem. So you, maybe not, you're not running in all these stupid, unique like, environments. Pretty much, yeah. Okay. yeah. In practice, it really doesn't happen really well. You know, people would like to think, I think it's happened to me like one time. It was, was inconvenient when it happened, yeah. But <laughs> it's happened one time in many yeah, years. I was how often that would come up. Yeah, you really have to go pretty far out there. Um, it's hard to collide with um, if you have if you're including modules or behavior of some sort via a plugin on on an object or or whatever. Um, unless they do basically the same thing or very similar things, it's really hard to like hit a name that is going to be the same. Cause Overall, the Ruby community is pretty good at actually naming things well. Uh, so you won't get people who are naming things do it, and other people who are naming things do it. You'll get you know very specific, correct things. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Cool. Yeah, I've never actually. I think I've I've also had this problem once. Maybe I've never had it. I don't remember. I may just be remembering him telling me about it. <laughs> The project was huge too. It was like hundreds of models. Yeah, I'm sure it's hard to track them. Ridiculous. Yeah. Yeah, it's almost more likely with lots of gems and stuff to play with things are just getting crazy. Yeah. A library called uh, Vestal Versions stomped a, a bit over our app because of that, because they we already had a model of versions that was attached to software, so software can have many versions. And uh of course, Festal Versions comes around and says, I'm defining a versions method, and that doesn't work. And there was actually three or four other places within that library where the little namespacing could have helped. Yeah, it's yeah, it also defined changes, which had to change when they did the active record thing for changes. So now it's modifications. So some libraries, Festal Versions, not great. <laughs> it's a pretty cool library, yeah, but they, they definitely awesome. could have done better with the naming. <coughs> Yeah, you're more you're much more likely to run into two gems that want to create the same table name. That's actually happened to me several times. But oh yeah, devise the same. wants the users table. Oh, devise. <laughs> uh, yeah, so yeah, users tables are pretty common. Roles is a common one that gets completely <coughs> screwed. Uh, versions, stuff like that, um, and that one actually happens not regularly, but it happens often enough that it's happened to me a couple times. So. That's why you shot one for naming. <laughs> <laughs> Convenient. That's the small talk bear, right? Cool. Any other questions? What was that library you were showing off at the end? That's Access Archival. Could you explain what that is? Sure. Uh, so Access Archival is a, um, a plugin that we wrote because we didn't feel that anyone did a uh, deep object archiving correctly because uh, no one really does it atomically. If you used Act as Paranoid, uh, the way it works basically is uh, it overrides a bunch of, of active record methods in the first case, which is not awesome, but okay, I can deal with that. Um, but what it also does is um, when you delete an object, the theory is that you'll be able to resurrect it and everything will be honky dory. But what actually happens is your dependent destroy records get nuked and they're not connected in any way. Uh, there's no like, there's no hash, there's no good, there's nothing. They just get all the same 
they get the, the same uh, timestamp basically, and that's how you resurrect objects. You go and dig through your entire database and try to find objects that have the, uh, the same death time. Um, so what we did was we wrote a thing that instead of doing that, uh, you basically get a version GUID on all of the objects that are connected um, because really that's what you want when you resurrect a thing. You want everything that you deleted at that time to come back. So it kind of digs through, it uses some reflection and digs through um, active record object trees and archives and unarchives them atomically. So that is what it does. A good example of, like, of cases like Fox, like, like we, you know, like you have a class and Speak register. Up. And you have a class, I don't know, it's like, uh, it's, I, I don't mean like a programming class. Like, I mean, like you're, you're teaching a class or whatever, and there are registers for the class. Maybe there's some other things going on. Let's say you archive that class in the interface, and you're like, oops, I didn't want to do that. So you don't just want to pull back the class so that people can register it for again. You also want to pull back all the registrants, everybody on the waiting list, all of that. But it actually is paranoid basically on this family. So that's why we wrote it. It's a really nice library. I highly recommend it. Uh, if you hate yourself and want to spend many, many hours doing data fiddling, go for Axis Paranoid, because it will have that for you in spades. In spades. Thank you.